I am joining you from the territory of the Lagwankan speaking people, the territory of the First Nation of the Esquimo and Songhees First Nations. I'm Sheila Malcolmson, a British Columbia's Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Before anything, I want to speak to the tragic loss of the 12 year old girl here in Victoria, Ali Thomas. Um, she died of suspected overdose last week. We are thinking of her family and friends and those who worked hard to get her the support that she needed and deserved. It's a tragic loss. I can only imagine that her family and friends are in shock. Uh, it is, uh, it's unspeakable that a person so young with so much ahead of them uh, is taken in this way. Uh, we are mourning across British Columbia this very hard past year, uh, the loss of over 1,700 people to the overdose crisis. And uh, that someone so young is in our hearts today is something that informs our work every day. Every life, every person matters. Our government is committed to doing more, to build up, the supports that mean that family and youth and anybody in mental health or addictions crisis gets the help that they need when they need it and where they need it. We have a lot more lives to save and, and today we are, um, we, are, we are noting that loss and, and extending again our condolences to the family and friends of Ali Thomas. This young girl and so many others that we have lost in British Columbia will continue to inform our work as a government and, and drive us forward to do more and to do better. Today is an announcement of just one of the many commitments that we are making to connect youth to social services um, and those light, vital life-saving services that they need. And I'm glad to be here alongside my friend and colleague, Mitzi Dean, the Minister for Children and Families, um, and also the Executive Director of Foundry, Dr. Steve Mathias. We're also grateful to welcome, and we will hear from in a couple of minutes, Sydney Spence, a valued youth peer advisor, and Christine Harris, a family peer supporter at, with Foundry BC. It means a lot to be here with this range of people, uh, both in person and virtual, for this announcement today. Uh, we're also recognizing Mental Health Week and Child and Youth Mental Health Day. It's a day to reaffirm our, uh, our commitment and our recognition of our responsibility to serve children and youth. It's a day of awareness and, and recognition of the work ahead of us and a day for us to reinforce to young people that we care about their feelings, uh, their well-being and about their potential. A top priority in our work is to improve wellness for children, youth and young adults. We want every child to have their best possible start and we want them to get help as soon as they need it. And we will not stop until we transform the system of care in British Columbia for young people. We are bringing services to meet youth and their families in schools, in communities, in their homes. And just last week I was here with Minister Dean and Minister Jennifer Whiteside, Minister of Education, uh, to announce a historic investment coming out of Budget 2021 to expand vital services for children and youth across British Columbia to 15 more communities. This is an investment that will add more capacity on the ground where it's needed most and will ensure that when children and families need help, they don't knock on one door after another, after another, losing critical time in a time of critical need. But we know that more work is needed and as we create that comprehensive system of mental health and substance use care that people in British Columbia need and deserve, um, we have been working around the clock to build that system and we're moving forward at full steam uh, with more investments and more supports. Um, and this today is an opportunity to announce another milestone in that work. During this challenging time, greater support is coming to youth and families in every community in British Columbia bringing technology and mental health and substance use supports together today on Child and Youth Mental Health Day. We are launching the Foundry BC app 
from now on, every British Columbian, aged 12 to 24, and their caregivers can all access the health care, mental health, and substance use services support that they need and deserve. Through this mobile device, computer or phone from exceptional Foundry staff, um, they are welcoming and supportive and non-judgmental. This is a big win for families and youth who have had no access to these services close to home. And I know that an enormous amount of work has gone into developing this app and bringing us to this moment. It really is a, is a monumental step. Uh, there are so many people who have played a vital role in making that Foundry BC app come together today and all the virtual services that are available through our province. All the Foundry services were designed by and for youth and with youth in mind, making sure that the voices of young people in BC guided the process of this app's development from start to finish. And three of those inspiring people are here today to share the announcement. I'm grateful for how our Foundry family has stepped up during the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has exacerbated the mental health and substance use challenges that BC faces. It's been an absolutely critical partner, starting up virtual mental health supports for youth just weeks after the pandemic was declared more than a year ago. And today is a testament to Foundry's hard work, its dedication and drive to help young people and communities throughout British Columbia. So this spring, Foundry Youth showed me how to download the app um, and showed me how to use it. They uh, set up an appointment with me, a counseling appointment, and then we then flipped into that platform so I could see what it felt like face to face to be talking with a, a trusted counselor. Uh, I was really impressed with the layout of the, of the Foundry app, how welcoming it was, very much like walking into a physical Foundry uh, center. Um, and it was really quick and really easy to navigate. So I look forward to hearing the stories this morning of the many youth that will be helped, uh, have been helped already, that have been using the app, and, and we look forward with hope to the many youth that will be served across British Columbia on this new delivery platform. And I am now going to welcome my colleague, Minister Mitzi Dean, to say a few words. Thank you, Minister. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to be here in person with my colleague, Minister Malcolmson, on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, now known as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Virtually, as well, we're here with Steve Mathias, Sydney Spence, and Christine Harris to celebrate the launch of Foundry BC app. Thank you for joining us. As my colleague just said, the pandemic has affected youth in unprecedented ways. In all of my experience in family services, we're now seeing the most toxic drug environment with an unimaginable number of tragedies. It's been crucial for services to adapt so that youth and families can get the help that they need. Though we see their resiliency each and every day, it's never been more important to make sure that young people have access to services when, where, and how they need them. My colleague has outlined a number of the steps that our government has already taken to improve mental health services for young people across our province. And this app that we're launching today will give youth, especially those living in rural and remote areas of our province, the chance to seek and receive help and services on demand. From mental health care, substance use services, primary and sexual health care, youth and family, peer support and social services. The Foundry offers streamlined and coordinated options for youth and families to get the help and support they need when they ask for it. With in-person services being limited these days, BC's youth and families need flexible options and choices. And this app was made for youth by youth. So it gives them the opportunity to connect with peers for their own support. And it provides the ability to build safe relationships with like-minded individuals that they're comfortable with, making it easier for young people to get the help they need when they need it. This is a really important tool that is going to help youth 
overcome challenges and get back on the road to wellness. So I say thank you to Foundry BC and to your community partners and to our cross-ministry partners as well for making key supports available to more young people in their time of need. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Dean. I now welcome Steve Mathias, Executive Director of Foundry, to speak about the work that it took to get us to this announcement today. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, both uh, Ministers Malcolm. causes us to, to take a moment to just reflect on what that means and the importance of um, supporting and destigmatizing uh, help seeking during a time of need, um, moments when young people uh, are uh, struggling to access mental health uh, services. We know as many as one in five young people in any given year, particularly the teenagers and young adults, will have their struggles and, their that, struggles. That, that, and that, that, that has been made um, and, and really amplified, uh, but made worse by this pandemic. In many ways, I think it's um, our young people who have sacrificed the most during this time. Um, they may not be attending school at all uh, at this moment. They have lost employment opportunities. They've certainly lost their freedoms um, and their sort of ability to travel, ability to see friends, and many of the coping strategies that we've encouraged young people to use during non-pandemic times have been greatly limited, if not eliminated, during the lockdowns that uh, we have seen for young people around not only Canada, but internationally. And so we've been left in many ways to quickly find opportunities to have young people stay connected and to access those services that they would normally access in person. Um, to access those virtually. I have to admit that the app that we're launching today was five years in the making. And it was five years in the making because we recognized quite a long time ago that we needed to transform the way young people accessed health and social services. This work has been led by an incredibly dedicated group of young people who have worked with a, a small but mighty organization called Freshwork Studios to design the app that you see today. Um, we've had well over 1,500 young people using our virtual services in this past year. Close to 1,000 have used the app during a soft launch period. And I think that they have found it useful and easy to use and navigate our services. And we're really excited about what the future holds for not only the current state of the app, but all of the additions that we anticipate making in the coming months and years. I just want to thank again uh, the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Children and Families, also the Ministry of Education for their vision and strategy around youth mental health in this province. We understand that there is a lot of work ahead of us particularly given the epidemic that we continue to struggle with, the fentanyl crisis, uh, as well as the pandemic. And as we start to come out of the pandemic, we look forward to supporting young people to re-engage in so many of the activities that they look forward to and really making that transition uh, alongside them. Uh, using um, a team of dedicated counselors and peer support workers to be there for them when they need them. And so I encourage young people and their family members to download the app today and to check out the services that we offer in the hopes that we are able to uh, help uh, young people in the upcoming weeks as they reimagine uh, life coming out of the pandemic and really um, address any needs that they may have, whether it's mental health or substance use or physical health needs. Um, and access our services uh, through the app or through our 11 centers around the province. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Malcolmson. Back to you. 
Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, we're now going to turn to Sydney Spence, who's Foundry's Youth Advisor, uh, to share what the application means to her. Thank you so much, Minister. I have a lot of lived experience with mental health that's made me very passionate about helping others, particularly youth, who are overcoming some of the same obstacles that I have. So when I heard what Foundry was planning, I jumped at the chance to use my experience for something positive. And now that we're here, this really has felt like a once in a lifetime opportunity. My favorite part of this process, besides working with the amazing team at Foundry and the other youth committee members, has been seeing some of my ideas come to life. When we got to look at the first draft of the app, it was so exhilarating to see some of my input taking shape right in front of my eyes. This project is doubly important to me, however, because of my job. I'm a dance instructor in a small community called Powell River, and I have I work with some of the most amazing kids. There are some amazing, amazing kids here in this town. And over the last six years that I've worked at the studio, I have made some awesome connections with them. And our world today is full of so much fear and anxiety more so than ever before. And I'm seeing how greatly it is impacting the youth of our province. And so this app is gonna give them the easy and accessible access that they need. And it is a need and a help that they deserve. And so I am so proud and so honored to have played even a small part in helping them get it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney. And thank you for bringing what you've learned uh, in to help others. And uh, this is a key part of Foundry's work and, and the design of this app. We're also joined today by Christine Harris, who's a family peer supporter with Foundry BC. And she'll tell us about the services that this app offers to youth and to caregivers. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Thank you, Honourable Minister Malcolmson. Um, some years ago, I was looking for help and I was looking for supports. My son was a teenager struggling with substance use issues. I often felt alone, scared, and sometimes judged. Well-meaning friends and family tried to support me, but they couldn't because they couldn't understand what I was going through. How I wish I could have accessed a service like Foundry then and the Foundry app. At that time, there was just no services like that out there. So let's fast forward to today. Today, I am a family peer support worker with Foundry, British Columbia Virtual. And I am so honored to be in this position. Caregivers, I am here to stand with you, to listen to you without judgment. I am here as your peer. I've been in similar situations. I'm here to help caregivers access services through Foundry and services throughout British Columbia. I want you to know you're not alone, that myself and my colleagues here at the Foundry, we are here for you. We're here to stand with you, to listen and to support you in your times and struggles with your loved one. Please reach out to us at Foundry uh, through the app. Uh, we're here for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Um, thank you for bringing your experience forward to influence this uh, new tool and this new design to help others. Uh, before we take questions, we're going to take a minute just to have a look at what the Foundry app looks like and um, what kind of services it provides. Hi, I'm Sierra, support worker here at Foundry. In this, in this video, I'll be walking you through how to download the Foundry BC app, create an account, and access our services. The Foundry BC app can be downloaded from the Apple app and Google Play stores. Just search for Foundry BC. For those without a smartphone, these services can also be accessed through our desktop web portal. Just visit foundrybc.ca forward slash virtual to connect. And if internet access is a barrier, we're able to provide support by phone at 1-833-308-6379. Once you've downloaded the app, you'll be asked to log into an existing account or to create a new one. When you create an account, you will unlock access to all of our services and additional app features. If you are a young person ages 12 to 24 or a caregiver living in BC, you are invited to create an account and get started. Once you've created your account, you'll be asked to complete a survey. This survey helps the Foundry team get to know you a little bit better. The My Story feature allows you to share your journey with the Foundry team. If you pin and share your story, service providers can view it prior to your appointment. 
the Connect feature supports you to access our virtual services. Here, you can schedule counseling and peer support appointments in advance, access same-day services, sign up for a group, and view your schedule. The services available through the app are separate from local Foundry centers. These services will connect you to our provincial virtual services team. When it's time to access your appointment, you can join through the app or web portal. Press connect, go to view your schedule, click on your scheduled appointment, and follow the instructions. Voila, your session will soon begin. Now that you're all set up, explore the app and book an appointment. Have fun and hope to see you soon. Thank you, Minister, Steve, Sydney, and Christine for joining us to mark this important day. Um, thank you for your time and your attention this morning. Uh, we will now take your questions. Thank you, Minister. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up. First question will go to April Lawrence, Czech News. Oh, hi, thank you so much uh, for taking my question. Um, Minister, uh, you mentioned Elia Thomas um, at the beginning of your remarks today. Um, and while, uh, you know, today you're talking about improving access to youth counselling, which is great and I'm sure welcome by many, um, Alaya's family says that she refused counselling even after overdosing three times. So I'm wondering what your government is doing to protect children like this that are in high-risk situations but high risk of death who refuse help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it what a tragic situation uh, for um, for people that that work hard in the field uh, to support youth and families in their time of crisis. I um, I'm not going to speak to the specific supports that um, that were accessed in or offered in this particular case. Um, you know that will will come out in due course. Um, but you know we have. Uh, the work that we're undertaking as a province to broaden the the range of ways that young people can access supports, uh, just as we know there are many paths into addiction, uh, there are many ways to connect people with services. The announcement that we've made today with Foundry is a great example. Um, some youth that we certainly uh, heard from through the pandemic that were not willing to walk into a supervised consumption site, into an urgent primary care centre, into a hospital um, or into counselling, um, all things that are available for people in crisis. <clears throat> That, um, that they, in some cases, were willing uh, to access some of the virtual counselling uh, options that we stood up during the course of the pandemic, um, and that already youth have been using in this soft launch of the Foundry app, um, willing to engage with peers uh, and willing to engage in a way that maybe doesn't trigger some of the stigma or shame that we know can be a barrier to accessing services. Uh, we are working as hard as we can to build up a system of care that meets people where they are at in their healing journey, where they are at in the province, and their preference of who it is that they want to receive support and, and treatment and counselling from. Um, diversity is is our our goal. Um, that's what's going to get us out of this um, of this tragic uh, overdose crisis and mental health crisis. And and that's the work that we're that we're funding and that we're determined to. To implement. A reminder to reporters on the line, if you wish to ask a question, please press star one. April, do you have a follow-up? I do, yes, thank you. Um, two of the things I'm hearing from, from the health and children ex experts that I've been speaking with that the government um, could be doing right now to save lives is both safe supply and some form of involuntary stabilization in just the highest risk situations such as Bill 22 or a form of it. Um, what are you doing to move forward on those two particular issues? Mm -hmm. And we're working across the full continuum of response to the overdose crisis. Uh, one uh, measure is doubling youth treatment beds across British Columbia. Uh, in the interior, they've been announced already, soon to be announced on Vancouver Island. Across BC, 123 new 
publicly funded youth treatment beds. There's never been such a big expansion in, in British Columbia. Uh, so I want the public to know and, and members of the public to know that, that, where, uh, that there are many approaches uh, to supporting youth with addictions and mental health challenges. Um, and, uh, and we're working across the whole continuum. Uh, safe supply is something that British Columbia is leading on. Uh, there has already been a 400% increase in the number of people that are prescribed safer supply. Uh, we expanded uh, the program um, twice during the course of the early months of the pandemic and that work continues and it is funded in our budget. Uh, it's a uh, uh, the, the toxicity of the drug supply that has um, um, just become so much more life taking, life ending through the pandemic is something that the work of Safe Supply is continually working to catch up to. Um, and very grateful to everybody working in the front line, addictions, medicine, doctors and others that are, that are supporting um, this work in British Columbia on that. Um, on the question of stabilization care, it's uh, still something that, uh, that we hear from parents and that we believe as a government um, has a role to play. And I hear from families that say that uh, doing uh, some kind of uh, involuntary admission to hospital after an overdose um, is something that can save lives, and I believe that too. That's legislation that, as you know, we tested in the legislature last summer. Uh, we heard quite strongly from people on the front line that they want to see a broader system of voluntary youth treatment options um, so that if we do stabilize youth, that there, it, we are absolutely sure that we can connect people to the systems that will support their their healing and recovery after that involuntary admission. Um, and that is, uh, those are complex conversations that we'll continue to have while we're uh, taking action on expanding uh, youth mental health supports. Um, and it might be that um, that Steve Mathias also wants to weigh in on this because I know we've been having some uh, conversations along those lines as well. Yeah, thank you, Minister. I, I will add that I think that this is an incredibly nuanced conversation, and I, I don't know that this there is an obvious answer. And I, and I think that it's really important to recognize that um, on on one end of the spectrum are parents who are incredibly concerned about their you know, their their children, and um, and feel at times. Uh, left out of the loop in terms of information sharing and understanding the full risk that um, uh, is uh, in front of them. And at the other end, I think, is the um, really important consideration for the rights and civil liberties of our teenagers and understanding that striking a balance between the two is an incredibly difficult um, process and requires um, lots of conversations to get to a place where we can come in with some form of legislation that protects the rights of young people and also supports the care provider and the caregivers to ensure that their young people can get the help when they, they need help. And so I, I certainly think that our time right now with fentanyl is an unprecedented one. Um, we've never seen such a lethal substance on our streets. We've never had a, a drug that can see a, a, a young person as young as 12 just pass away in the blink of an eye. Um, and we are, I think, really needing to continue to transform um, a healthcare system that has, in many ways, just not been set up to address the needs that we have currently um, with, with such a crisis. Thank you. Next question, we go to Amy Smart, Canadian Press. Hey there, Minister. I'm wondering, um, you know, we've over the years of this overdose crisis, we've heard many politicians speak to particular cases and offer condolences. Um, and then there's some frustration about uh, how quickly things move or things like that. I'm wondering, um, you brought up Ali Thomas's case. Is there a particular lesson that you feel like you've learned from that case that you want to put into policy in the future? I appreciate the question and I look forward to learning from this tragic loss. Uh, and um, honestly, for me, it's too early. Uh, 
I, I, I want to honor your question, uh, but I, we don't yet know, I don't know yet enough about, um, about what services uh, were offered and, um, and where the gap happened. I, I can say that at, on every front already we have added more supports, more options for youth accessing the system, uh, trying to meet them where they're at and trying to learn from people, uh, families and, and youth on the ground about what uh, what interface into the mental health and addiction support system would work better for them. The announcement today about Foundry's app, as we heard five years in the making and in the building, is an example of another way for young people to access services. Um, and, and that we've already built out more youth treatment beds, that we've already added new urgent primary care centers where people can access addictions and mental health on a walk-in basis seven days a week, um, and more and more. There's much more for us to do, uh, but, but we are, we're continuing to build that system um, and we'll continue to be informed by the families and, and peers and young people that, for whom the system should be built. Amy, do you have a follow-up? Um, yes, one of the things that the family has raised is just how young she was and how there really wasn't anything appropriate for her. Like it wouldn't be quite appropriate for her to be with 16 year olds. Um, what is the plan for those, you know, I know it's a small number, but small number of families that are struggling with this, this level of a problem and they don't, they don't see a space for their kid. Yeah that it's as young as a, that, that there was someone as young as age 12 it is is shocking and again um you know i this this is a, a terrible story that just re uh, strengthens our commitment as a government to to build the kind of addictions and mental health care system that that anybody can access. We know young people are struggling with mental health um, and, and we have responded to that with new, for example, investments in eating disorders uh, through our budget, um, half a billion dollar budget altogether that was announced uh, two weeks ago. Eating disorders is a, is a particular area that needs investment and, and focus um, and that's something that our budget does. Uh, there is um, the ability for um, anybody in any health authority, and I know in this case for Island Health to waive any age requirements. Some, if anybody needs access to life-saving support, age is not a barrier. Um, and so, so that is a tool that we know is in place. Um, um, and, and as we add, doubling the number of youth treatment beds will certainly be um, accommodating people of all ages um, so that they can get the support they need and, and keep these young people alive. We have time for one more question. We'll go to Mary Brooks, Island Social Trends. Hi, thanks for taking my question. So um, a quick first question is, are there any new services offered through Foundry BC or is this basically an app that redirects to existing services? Do you want to speak to that, uh, Steve, from a, a navigation perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, so the question is whether or not there are added um, resources. So Foundry uh, Virtual was really created out of the crisis that was the pandemic. And so we, we uh, began our services um, in April using uh, counseling services that existed in our centers, in our 11 centers who band together to provide a provincial service. Um, and then with the support of the government in June, we began hiring staff to provide uh, a standalone service. And that, that service continues to expand and will continue to expand um, with uh, over the next uh, year so that the, um, the added volume that we anticipate seeing with the app uh, will, uh, we hope, be met with uh, an expanded workforce to support the, um, the work ahead. Mary, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, thanks. I'm wondering if uh, this app will be uh, promoted to or recommended to the K-12 education system to the school districts because the counseling programs in the school districts appear to be sometimes underfunded and, or, and possibly based on uh, traditional models of counseling, um, not looking outside the box. So uh, where does Foundry BC fit in with the um, education system? 
a week ago when I stood with uh, Ministers Whiteside and Dean to announce uh, the expansion of integrated child and youth teams to 15 more school districts across British Columbia was just with a kind of program like this in mind. Uh, we're adding uh, the $56 million investment, 350 new full-time uh, community mental health care workers um, across many disciplines. And it will be their work to identify needs sometimes informed by, um, by school counselors or teachers, uh, but it could be anywhere in the community that we are uh, identifying uh, children in need, uh, the uh, resources that are available, and making that interconnection uh, between um, uh, uh, r resources available um, in any region, virtually or otherwise, uh, and, uh, and beyond. And I'm just getting a little note passed to me uh, to say that uh, Steve Mathias can also speak to this question. Uh, thanks again, Steve. Yeah, and, and it's a great question. And, and sorry if you can hear my dog drinking water in the background. Um, we, uh, I'll add that we already know that uh, for young people ages 12 to 17, accessing our services, school counselors are the second most likely uh, folks to refer them to our services. And so we've been working with the Ministry of Education and the network of school districts around this province to uh, help them um, learn about uh, Foundry. Uh, Foundry is also supported through Children's Hospital, so it's a partnership between Providence Healthcare and Children's Hospital. Uh, so there is a fairly large network uh, of folks who are available uh, to uh, promote the work that we do. And certainly the school counselors in this province are um, aware of uh, Foundry uh, virtual and our Foundry online resources. Thank you to our speakers, to the ministers, and to everyone on the line. That concludes the media portion of today's event. I believe we will now be moving to a photograph. Yeah. Uh, thank you to the media for your interest. Uh, thank you again so much to the Foundry team for, uh, for building this new support for young people in British Columbia. We're grateful for your work. And I'm now going to invite my colleague, Minister Dean, uh, to come up and join for a photo.